Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the last week, there's been a fair amount of excitement from astronomers because of the discovery of a what could be the largest cometary nucleus ever. It's way out on the very edge of the solar system, and its orbit will only carry it to about 10 AU, so it's never going to generate the massive cometary tail that we might see from Earth. But this object remains interesting to astronomers who can track it and observe it and try to understand its properties. So the thing is, it was first imaged back in 2014. This was part of a project called the Dark Energy Survey. This was a telescope in South America which repeatedly scanned large parts of the sky looking for supernova and galaxies and then using that information to constrain or refute potential models of dark energy, uh, dark matter, or other theories for that matter. I mean, people understandably have problems with dark energy and dark matter because they can't see the effects at small scales. And so there are many other conjectures out there as to what's going on and driving the universe. And dark energy survey is critical to actually showing whether these theories hold water or not. And so far we failed to produce an alternative which satisfies all the observations. So this survey was looking for galactic scale things, they weren't looking for objects inside the solar system, but the data can still be analysed, and a group led by Pedro Bernardinelli and Gary Bernstein analysed this and they found hundreds of new objects which had never previously been seen. They also found hundreds of cases of objects that other people had found, but the Dark Energy Survey had the first image of, and so they could actually then use that to propagate the orbit backwards and get a better orbit. But this object was first imaged on October 20th, 2014. And based on that, that's how they get the provisional designation, the name. So the, it was originally called 2014 UN271. So 2014 is the year. U specifies that it's the second half of October. Basically, every two weeks or so or half month is split into a letter. And then the N271 indicates that it's the 6,730. 94th object discovered in that two-week span. This was a naming system that was developed when people expected to find a handful of objects per month. But since the discovery, a number of people went out and made follow-up observations, and they have seen that it appears to have a coma, a cloud of dust around the nucleus. And that means that it's a comet, and that means the d naming system changes. For comet discoveries, you get your name on the comet right away, so it becomes Comet 2014 Bernardinelli Bernstein. The thing is, according to the team, it was, there was a good chance that they wouldn't actually have found this. When they're doing these uh, comparisons against the old data to look for the object, they have to sort of make assumptions about how far away the potential objects are. And if they're too close, they actually move too far to be correlated as a single object. They were expecting to find things greater than 30 AU out. And the very first image they have is at 29 AU, so it's just inside their detection limit. But I guess the fact that it's bigger and brighter than expected meant that it was discoverable, and they they ended up with this. So now that we've had about five or six years worth of data to observe it, we know that its orbit is pretty well constrained. So right now it's below the plane of the planets and it's coming along in an orbit with a 98 five degree inclination, sorry. Um, so it's observable from the southern hemisphere. It's going to continue underneath the plane of the ecliptic and come to its perihelion, closest approach to the sun, in January of 2031. It will be 10.95 AU from the sun, which is pretty far out as these things go. The orbit that it's on right now has a period of 3 million years. That means the last time it was in the solar system was 3 million years ago. And during this encounter, it's actually going to get a little kick from the planets, and that's actually going to increase its period to four and a half million years. So it's coming below the plane of the ecliptic, it's going to come up over the top and then head off back into deep space. And it will only really be visible by telescopes. But the fact that it was visible out at 30 AU indicates that it's probably quite big. We don't actually know how big it is. If you had the best telescopes with the highest magnification in the world, you still wouldn't be able to resolve this. It would still be less than a single pixel. But we do know how bright it is. And you can make assumptions based upon how uh, bright it appears to be 
uh, you can make assumptions about how much it could reflect, and that gives you ideas of how large the object could be. And it could be anything from 60 kilometers up to about 370 kilometers, depending on its albedo, depending upon how much it reflects light back at us. But we don't know, and we might get some better clues when we get more observation. However, there is a wrinkle to this. The fact that it was observed recently to have a cometary nuclei, a, sorry, a coma around it, that makes it much brighter. Now, the object is now in at 20 AU, so the question is, did it have an accompanying cloud of dust when it was out at 30 AU? We don't know. It could be that this object isn't actually as big as we think. Cometary activity increases as it moves towards the sun, as the heat from the sun boils off certain volatile materials. And if this comet has been on a multi-million year orbit, it hasn't paid very many visits to the middle of the solar system. So it could be that this is well preserved and has a whole bunch of very, very volatile material on its surface. Alternatively, it could actually be a really big object. Not that it will be big enough for us to see from the ground because it's not coming close enough to generate a monstrous tail. But if you remember back in the 1990s, yes, I know a long time ago, before some of you were born, Comet Hale Bob, it came in and it was a 60 kilometer nuclei. That was spectacular. It hung around for months. Everybody in the world saw this and it was burned into my head. So many views of this. And people actually forget that because of the orbit of Hale-Bopp, it actually never came close to the Earth. As it moved around to where the Earth would have been, the Earth moves out of the way, so we never got a really spectacular view of Hale-Bopp, right? The thing is, there's probably lots of comets that are this size that fly through the solar system and they never get close enough to the sun to see them. And this is actually one example of an object which we weren't previously able to discover. It's only recent techniques, not just in the observation, but in the computer processing of all that data that can pick these things out from the background. Comets get active close to the sun because their surface layers are being boiled off and they're losing gas. And the thing is, that only works if the comet has spent a lot of its life far away from the sun. And you might have something like uh, an object that set, spends its time out in the Kuiper belt and then gets kicked down by a series of planetary interactions and becomes a, a short period comet for a while. Or you might have something which is on a highly eccentric orbit that only comes through the center of the solar system every now and then. And sometimes its perihelion is low enough to be seen. Meanwhile, most of the orbit is out at aphelion, the furthest point from the sun. So, you know, when you've got an object on a highly eccentric orbit, it spends most of its time at the f distant point when it's moving very, very slowly. And this is actually how uh, I imagine the Oort cloud. A lot of people think of the Oort cloud as just the spherical shape shell of comets sort of circular in circular orbits around the sun but that's not the case they're on highly eccentric orbits that bring them down close to the planets and just sometimes their orbits get adjusted so that they come close enough to the sun to actually produce uh you know trail comet tails on their pass the red but most of their life they are out very far from the sun and this is how it looks like a cloud because they spend so much time this far out but yeah, the most interesting thing I, I think about this discovery is it just shows that the limits for discovering objects have been pushed further and further out by new technology. And this is good because it was only recently that we discovered interstellar objects. We knew that they must exist, that they must come from other stars, but the fact that we'd never seen one was, had left us you know, quest, to question our understanding and es, you know, assumptions about the universe. But now we've seen Borisov and we've seen Oumuamua, and you know the universe is opening up to us. So yeah, congratulations to Pedro Bernardinelli and Gary Bernstein for this discovery and for the hundreds of other objects that you found in this data. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.